Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I took a visit to a Norwegian mitten exhibit. I have updates on my Finish It February progress, and I wanna share with you a couple of 20th century knitting-related inventions that were intended to make yarn management for intarsia knitting more efficient. So let's get started. So I have an update on my Finish It February projects. Finish It February, if that concept is new to you, is an opportunity to reduce your pile of UFOs, your unfinished objects. I've uh, started talking about it in January and gave tips for how to go through your entire, entire pile and how to um, make decisions about whether or not you want to continue going forward with them and then how to kind of get yourself organized and motivated in order to work through and make progress on finishing those things. February is a month where I really focus on finishing those unfinished things and I've made good progress on the things I intended to finish this month. The projects I had in mind were re-knitting two sleeves of my 1960s vintage sweater project. The first time I knit them, they came out kind of, the gauge was off. They didn't fit well in the armhole and I knew I needed to re-knit them. I also wanted to put some elbow patches on a much loved sweater that was wearing thin in the elbows. And I needed to knit the second sock of a pair of knee socks. So far, I have knit the first sleeve of the sweater. I knit the knee sock. I put the patches on the sleeves of my uh, sweater and what I needed to do at the end of the month was knit that second sleeve. I wanted to separate the knitting of the sleeve so it wouldn't be too boring and that would keep me motivated to break it up with those other smaller projects in between. So I did start the sleeve I think last weekend, the second sleeve. This is the sleeve cap. I knit the sleeve cap at, from the underarm going up to get the shaping exactly right and then I knit the rest of it going down. I originally did it that way because I was unsure about the amount of yarn that I had and whether or not I'd be able to knit full length sleeves. At this point, because I've improved my gauge issues and I also corrected some of the size issues that I felt um, were a problem with the first set of sleeves, I don't have any fear of running out of yarn. So my spreadsheet, which I always rely on uh, to help me keep track of where I am in my project, uh, the spreadsheet tells me I'm 82% of the way completed with the sleeve, so there won't be any problem finishing it this month. And I was feeling really good about getting all my projects done uh, for finish of February, possibly early, but I kept having this niggling feeling in the back of my head that there was another project. I could, just couldn't think of what it was. And it's, I couldn't think of what it was because it wasn't a knitting project. I kept thinking, what else is there for me to finish that's knitting? And it's not knitting. It's my breed study for spinning on my spinning wheel. I mentioned it at the beginning of the month and then I forgot about it, even though my spinning wheel is sitting very close to my desk, but it's sitting very close to my desk. It's been doing that for the past few months without me doing anything. And so it just, I wasn't even seeing it. So I did realize the other day, oh, <laughs> I have one more thing. But that's something that once I get back into it, I will just do that alongside my other knitting. So I probably won't finish all five of the breeds uh, of the breed study before the end of the month mostly because as I spin, it's only one ounce of each variety, but it needs to sit overnight before I can ply it. And so uh, there's just some resting that the yarn needs to do in, in between each uh, step or that I like to do in between each step. So I would rather just do it that way than try to you know, make myself be done with it by February 28th. There's really no point in that. That is my update on my Finish It February projects. I'm um, sailing through and everything is looking great. <laughs>
Last month, I had a tidbit segment on a Norwegian mitten ex exhibit that was going on here in the Twin Cities. I fully intended to go to it and it slipped my mind. And then a couple of weekends ago, we our guild has these uh, knitting groups, like social knitting groups that we do by Zoom. And it was a couple of Sundays ago and there were, I think, three different people who mentioned that they had gone to this exhibit and how much they had enjoyed it. And they had all gone on different days of the week at different times. And one of the things that I'd been concerned about, because I really did want to go see it, but I didn't want to go somewhere and be enclosed in an area for a long time when there was a lot of other people around. And in my head, why wouldn't everybody in the Twin Cities <laughs> be at that mitten exhibit. But every single person said when they were there, they were the only ones there. And some of them went in, in groups, like a knitting group went together, or a couple of friends went together, but they were the only ones there. So one of the other people in our knitting group really wanted to go to it, and but she could only go on Saturday. And originally I was like, there's no way I'm gonna go on a Saturday because it's gonna be too crowded. But once I heard nobody else was probably gonna be there, um, and I had somebody to go with, because I love looking at this stuff with somebody else who's just as enthusiastic uh, as I am, because we're going to see things that the other one isn't going to see, and then we can talk about it and think, what do you think about this? And, and it's just so much more fun. So we met there on Saturday at 10.30 and we were the only ones there uh, for most of the time. There was a, a period where a group of three people showed up and it felt like they were just there for a couple of minutes and then they left and I said, boy, they weren't here very long. And Heather looked at her watch and said, it's noon. So we had been there for an hour and a half already in this one room looking at two walls of mittens. And the time had just flown by. In the room is a rectangular room. It might be 30 feet by 15 feet or something like that. Um, the main exhibit was on one of the short walls and one of the long walls. There was another wall where there were a few things on display. So right when you walk in, you see a few things on display and it kind of gives a little bit of information about what the exhibit is. And we, so we were looking at those items at first and then we kind of got our bearings and, and saw what else was going on. So on the short wall, these were mittens that people had agreed to put on display. They were like something in their, in their personal collection or something that a relative had made for them or that they had made for a relative. But they were just examples of Norwegian mittens um, that people had on display. There were a couple of those that were really cool. One of them was a pair of mittens. They were blue and white mittens, beautifully knit by a woman who was born in 1886 and died in 1955. So those mittens are at least 67 years old, probably older than that, and they were in perfect condition. They were just beautiful. And then there were some adorable tiny, tiny little mittens that, that somebody had knit for their grandniece. Uh, oh, they're so cute. And then there was this really cool pair of mittens that was like a couple's pair. I've heard of those before, but I'd never seen any in person. And I, I kind of wonder if that's just like a symbolic gift that you would give to a newlywed couple. The idea is that there's a single mitten for the woman, a single mitten for the man, and then you have this double mitten that you can be holding hands with inside. And so her mitten had a kind of a stripe cuff with the feather and fan design on it. And then his was a stockinette cuff with stranded color work on the cuff as well as on the hand. And then the long wall was, were mittens that were knit by a group, a knitting group that meets at Norway House. And they had all decided to knit books from a specific book that is called Mittens from Around Norway, written by Nina Granlund Setter, I think is how her her last name is pronounced. I believe it was a book that was originally written in Norwegian and then translated to English. I'd be interested if any of you 
who are Norwegian know about this book or have this book? Because I do have a question about a certain section in the book wondering if it was added for English speakers or if it, what it was. And I'll get to that in a little bit. What was really interesting about these mittens, every, every pair was different. So I think there's somewhere around 40 different designs in this book. And there maybe was somewhere around 25, 30, probably maybe close to 30 different pairs that were actually on exhibit. So not every, every pattern from the book was on display, but a lot of them were. And most of them were knit using the same color combination as was used in the book. There was one pair of mitts that was a solid color and in the book it was pink, but on the display it was blue. That was a really interesting pair because it had this kind of interesting cuff that angled down, it was very oversized. I'm guessing the idea was that it was worn over the uh, sleeve, like a coat sleeve, uh, to help keep the wind out that way. It, that's my guess. Um, and then there was one pair of stranded color work where the book originally had two colors of pink, like a light and a dark pink, and the person who had knit it had used like a pink and a turquoise. But otherwise, most of the mittens were like a white and a, and a dark color. There, was, um, there were a couple pairs that had more, more than just two colors. Um, so it was really fun to you know just look and compare because they had several copies of the book in the room so you could actually and they would on the display they would tell you what page number that pattern is from so you could look at it in the book and then look at it on the wall. One of the things that was really interesting was that even though the colors were the same, there was a difference in the appearance of the mittens on display versus the mittens in the book. So what we're noticing about the mittens on display is that the knitters had used a technique in stranded color work called parallel floats. So if you have two colors of yarn, you're keeping those two yarns parallel as you work across uh, the round. So one of the colors is always held above and the other one is always below. The one that is carried below is said to have dominance because the stitches, because they are being carried lower, they have to extend higher in order to create the stitch. And this is particularly true at the transition. So if you have a single stitch, that stitch is going to look larger. Or if you have a span of stitches, that first stitch and the last stitch of that span are likely to look larger than the ones in between. A yarn dominance, something that's that's well known in fair isle knitting, which is a specific subset of stranded color work. And fair isle knitting has some very specific rules about how you use yarn, uh, how often you need to, to change from one color to another, uh, which yarn should be dominant, that kind of thing. Norwegian knitting and most knitting traditions don't have rules that are that strict. They just leave it up to the knitter to do whatever works for them. A couple of years ago when I was taking a Latvian mitten class because I thought it was just something interesting um, to learn about the history and we were having to deal with three colors in some rows instead of two and I was trying to figure out well how would you do that I started you know looking at what other people knitting Latvian mittens were doing and how and people were doing things in different ways and th there weren't any rules in Latvian uh, knitting but one of the things that some people did were, was to use what they were called rotating floats. So every time you switched a color, you brought the new one underneath the old one. And so that would create some twist, um, angled look on the side. The, the strands wouldn't be kept uh, parallel. I've done some uh, videos on this previously, which I will link to. And I also did a Technique Tuesday video on rotating floats versus parallel floats. When I was doing that, I got very interested in other traditions and being able to find out what other traditions uh, did. And because this part of the country uh, has a lot of people of Norwegian and Swedish descent and German descent, there tend to be institutions around that are centered around that background. Like we have the Swedish Institute is one place, Norway House is another. But down in Decorah, Iowa, which is just uh, west of Minnesota, a couple of hours west, there was a museum called the Vesterheim. And they have all kinds of, and it's the National Museum of Norwegian 
immigrants. And they have a, a, a lot of different types of textiles in their museum. And amongst the textiles that they have are somewhere between 25 and 30 Norwegian sweaters, sweaters that were knit in Norway, anywhere from like 1908 to the 1980s. So by all different knitters and different time periods from different parts of the country, but they were all knit by Norwegian knitters in Norway. And so I wanted to take a look at those sweaters. I got permission from the archivist to come down. She, she bring a few sweaters out at a time. I turn them inside out and I would examine the backs of the, of the sweater, the back of the fabric, so I could look and see how they were knitted. Did they use parallel floats? Did they use rotating floats? And what I noticed was that they, when only two colors were in play, most of the time they used parallel floats, but what surprised me was that frequently, not always, but frequently, the background color was the one that, that had the dominance. And so the color, like if it was a lice pattern where it was a lot of, of background color and then just little single stitches, they would have that, the color that was creating those little single stitches was the non-dominant color. So those stitches were smaller. They didn't look oversized um, as they would if you were doing it in Fair Isle. So that was really interesting to me. It never occurred to me that somebody would deliberately used yarn dominance, but use it so that the foreground color, the color actually creating the pattern would be non-dominant. So I did a video, a technique video on parallel floats and rotating floats where I compared the same um, band of strand of color work with the foreground color being dominant, the background color being dominant, and then using rotating floats so that you could see um, how they looked different. As we're looking at all of these mittens, we can tell that every knitter who knit for the exhibit had used yarn dominance in their knitting. They'd used parallel floats and they had chosen the foreground color, the, the color creating the pattern. They'd used that as the dominant color. But when we looked and compared them to the book, it didn't look that way. So the patterns tended to look a little bit more delicate because you saw more of the background. When the foreground color uh, stitches were, were bigger, they took up more room and the background really receded. Where uh, when you uh, flipped that and you had the foreground color be non-dominant, uh, it just looked more delicate because those stitches were a little smaller. Um, but I, I was looking at that and I thought, well, I wonder if they gave any instruction in this book about how to manage the yarn and what that instruction was. Because I couldn't actually tell if that was parallel floats where they used the pattern color with the non-dominant yarn, or if they had used rotating floats, which doesn't create a different size in stitches. The stitches are all the same size. So we looked at the beginning of the book. So they did have some instruction in there about keeping the yarns parallel and not switching or making sure that the one on top is always on top and, and you don't switch those out. And then they said, this is called yarn dominance. But they didn't, they didn't really go into, into what that meant and they didn't give any instruction about which one should be on, on top versus on the bottom. So they didn't say which color should be dominant, the background or the foreground. They just said, don't mix them up. So it's clear that in the book, if they were using parallel floats, what they were doing was keeping the background in the dominant color. But it was really interesting to be able to compare that many different stitch patterns knit in with uh, yarn dominance done in one way with the same exact pattern knit uh, with the yarn dominance done the other way. So that was super fun. And I'm not saying at all that the peep, that the mittens on exhibit were knit incorrectly. I'm saying that's, what that's the choice they made and that's going to be probably the choice a lot of people have assumed you should make you should make is if you're going to use parallel floats and you should have the dominant color do this a lot of people do learn learn that because that is something that is correct for fair isle knitting it's not required though for other uh, knitting traditions you get to pick uh, which way you want to do it and i just thought it was a fantastic example of the differences uh, that you can, the different result that you can get when you choose one method over the other.
So at the end of December, I started a new vintage sweater project. I'm, I have a long-term project where I am knitting a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. The 1960s sweater that I'm do, working on for Finish It February, I'm re-knitting those sleeves. That sweater is part of this project. Uh, and then the sweater I started at the end of December uh, is my 1940s. Uh, sweater for 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 this project so this is the back of that sweater and then this is one of the sleeves so those triangles are going in the opposite direction which is kind of interesting so the the technique that is used in order to knit this design is called intarsia or color block knitting it's very different from the stranded color work process used for those Norwegian mittens I was just talking about I've been knitting intarsia designs since I was a new knitter in the mid 80s. There was a very popular technique used in sweaters back at that time. And so in the first few months I was a knitter, I, I would probably knit my first intarsia design. And over the years, I used different techniques for managing the yarn. So in the first 19 years I was a knitter, I didn't know any other knitters and the way I learned to knit was following the instructions and patterns. And so if the pattern said you need to separate bobbin for each one, I at the yarn shop found out what a bobbin was and bought those. And so those would be dangling from the work. I have a smaller quantity of yarn because you have to have a separate yarn source for each of these sections. So even though there's gray on these two sides, it's one ball of, of gray for here and one ball of gray for the other. And sometimes when you knit a sweater or a project, it might have many, many, many color changes. Like this is my 1920s sweater and it, you know, the sleeves were cast on horizontally. And so those red triangles and those yellow uh, or the, the red diamonds and the yellow triangles you know, create separate areas. There was close to 30 different color changes in those rows. So you have to find a way to handle each one of those little yarn sources. So depending on how big those blocks of color are, I might use a different way of creating a yarn source. So in something like this sweater, which I knit back in around 1990, this is the back of the sweater. So I would have, I would have had bobbins for some of the background area but for the little tiny areas of color I might just let a single strand of yarn dangle down and just use it as I as I needed it so one of the problems with intarsia is things tangle up and it gets very annoying it's something you have to cope with and people are always trying to figure out what's what's a good way of doing that so I tend not to like the bobbin method as much. First of all, I have to find a separate tool and wind something around there, wind the yarn around it. Uh, you can use a piece of cardboard, but you have to find a way to anchor the yarn in there. And so it has to be a slot that is going to grab uh, the yarn. So there's bobbins and then there's yarn butterflies where you basically are creating, you know, a, a couple of yards worth of yarn that you're creating this little butterfly and it acts as a center pull ball uh, so you can always release more yarn as you need it. Um, this is what I tend to use. I tend to use a combination of butterflies and hanging strands. But when I was thinking about this design, I was thinking about well, how much yarn am I going to need for a given triangle? Because what I like to do is wind off the amount of yarn I need for that block of color into a butterfly and then I let it hang there. But this design, those triangles, I'm working with fingering weight yarn. So these triangles have like 350 stitches. So it was like five yards of yarn I was going to need, which is kind of a lot to do in a butterfly. And then the other thing about this is that these, this is a vertical repeat. So these triangles connect to each other. And what I realized is that the yellow, the gray on this, on this edge, and the purple never would have to be cut. I could just use a single ball continuously. Well, how was I going to do that with intarsia? How, how was I going to manage that when you have to keep you know, twisting the yarns around each other? Um, the yellow and the other gray did have to be cut or you'd have to do something where you trapped uh, yarn on either a wrong side row or a right side row, depending on which color it was and how the triangles were working. 
So potentially you could avoid cutting those. So I was thinking this is just a different intarsia situation than I normally have. And I was just thinking about what am I going to do? And I was doing my swatching to make sure that I had my stitch counts down and my gauge right and everything. When I saw a tweet from the Center for Knit and Crochet. So they're an online digital archive of knitting history. And they tweeted this out, which I'm going to show in the screen, uh, and which was about Anne McDonald and how she had patented this uh, device uh, called the Great Scott Argyler. And it was meant for managing uh, yarn for intarsia projects. And then they, they asked, do you know what else she's famous for? And I thought, Anne McDonald, is it just that it's sort of a common-ish type of name? But it did sound familiar to me. I thought, I, I must know her. But I thought, well, that's so cool. I want to look at this patent. And I was reading through this patent. And I thought, oh, oh, this is that, that method that I've heard about for many years. But when I tried visualizing how it was going to work, I just thought there's no way this is going to work. Even though I heard people mentioning it over and over again, I just like, I couldn't visualize it. I hadn't seen it, I hadn't tried it. And so I was visualizing it in a way that was clearly not going to work and therefore it must not work. These people, these people are saying it works when it doesn't is how my brain was working. So I read this patent and I realized this is that process people are talking about, but she created an actual device. So the device that she created was a, a series of boxes. Like this is just my, um, what are these, uh, paperclip box. But it, this is the type of box it was where it's plastic and it has a lid that separates and that nests in here. Her boxes would have been a little bigger than this and they would have had a hole in the top like this, like I have for my paper clips but the hole would have been smaller for hers. So she had this series of boxes and then they were attached to like a board. So they were all lined up uh, and attached to a board, a rigid surface. And then that surface sat on your lap. So there might be like seven or eight of these little boxes on this board and you have your ball of yarn, your center pole bar, ball of yarn inside here and then it's being fed out there. And you have them all lined up in the color, in the order. So if it, if you were knitting, you know, something like this, you'd have, you know, gray, yellow, purple, gray. You'd have those four colors in that row. And so you'd knit across your right side row and you'd have to link the colors together, but the boxes wouldn't move. And I demonstrated this in Tuesday's video, Technique Tuesday video on yarn management, I showed this method. I didn't have things in containers like this. I just had balls of yarn like this just sitting on, on the table. So, and so the balls didn't move. But some people would do, do put them in, in some kind of container with a, a hole in it. You could use even like a, a strainer like a pasta strainer that had big enough holes. You could do, do through that. If you have a yarn bowl that has a couple of holes, just depends on how many color changes you have. So if you just have a few, a device like this works really well. So anyway, you work across all the colors and they do get linked together. The first one gets linked to the second, the second one is linked to the third. So they do create like a chain of links, but that's not a tangled mess like I was imagining in my head. And then you turn the needle, which is going to cause all of the, the strands to kind of rotate around each other. But as you are working across on the purl row and you are linking the colors, you're unlinking the link that you created. And then when you get done with that row and you, and you turn the work again in the opposite direction that you turned it the first time, everything is back, everything's parallel, everything's tidy. So I thought this, I have to try this. And so I, try, I tried it out and I messed it up a couple of times because I'm used to, I have muscle memory for always turning my work in the same direction. When I'm knitting flat, I just always rotate in the same way. And so I had to learn to rotate a one way for a knit row and, and the other way for a purl row. And so I got used to that. And so I, I did get used to that. What it allowed me to do is sit at my desk with four complete balls of yarn that just sit there and 
they link to each other and then they unlink and everything is back. Nothing gets twisted, nothing's dangling and, and twisting around. It's fantastic and I love it. And I'm very grateful to Ann McDonald for coming up with this method. And I, so I looked, I thought, I wanna see, at first I wanted to see if I could find one of these devices. I'm looking on eBay, I'm looking everywhere. I did find some ads for it when it came out in 1985. They, it was advertised in the first couple of issues at least of Threads Magazine, which was a brand new magazine uh, at the time. The patent expired in 2005, which is right around the time I first started running into other knitters. And so I didn't have this uh, context of the great Scott Argyle. Like I didn't have a context of an actual device or anything. Uh, I just had this description of people say, oh, I just put it in containers and, and it all works out. So the problem was I'd never tried it, but to be fair to me, the kinds of projects, you know, that I typically was doing with Argyle are something like this where I might have 30 color changes and that there's kind of a practical limit to the number of balls that you could do this with. And certainly if you had actual small balls of yarn trying to, and trying to sit them on your desk, if they don't weigh very much, they're going to start flying around and they're going to start tangling with each other without you uh, intending them to. So that's another reason to have a container that keeps the ball, if it's getting pulled around a little bit, it, it contains it. But it also if you have this attached to a surface, that prevents the ball from flying around as well. So she really thought it through. But I, I kept thinking, I, I know I must have a book written by Ann McDonald in my office somewhere. And I, and I have so many books that I, I had no idea what one it would be. So I Googled her and I saw that I do have a book by her. It was the first book I bought that was about knitting, but it wasn't a knitting book. And it was uh, this book right here. No Idle Hands, The Social History of American Knitting. It turns out that she had been a history teacher and an avid knitter. And so when she retired and she create the, created this great Scott Argyle, or is the device, the name of the device, <clears throat> she started marketing it and selling it by mail order. And, you know, she had worked on getting this thing patented and she did get it patented in 1985, but it was her third try before she actually got the patent approved. The first two times she'd gone through a patent uh, attorney who understands how you have to present things with drawings and how you have to format things, but doesn't understand knitting. And so she was so discouraged by that. She thought, okay, I'm going to figure this out myself because I need to be able to explain why this is a unique device, why this is something that is not like anything else that already exists. And it was by doing it herself that she was able to finally get the patent. But it also made her curious about other women who have invented things. So the next book that she wrote, Feminine Ingenuity, Women and Invention in America. So she has all manner, she has the history of how the patent office was created here in the US and the first and then the first woman who got a patent and then she goes through each century you know really innovative things that women have done sometimes they were in women's areas but not always and sometimes they were women who invented something and then their husband's like we got to get this patented and and so he gets the patent somebody trying to sell a device that's exactly like what they did and so they have to go to court over it and then they start taking depositions and calling people <laughs> as witnesses and it turns out oh no it, you didn't invent it either it was your wife and so they put her name on the patent because it was her invention after all what wasn't in this book was another knitting invention created by a woman who in the 1950s who also had come up with a way of dealing with intarsia yarn management. So I don't know if she deliberately excluded it because it was like the same, it was the same field as hers and she was trying to do a lot of different things or if there was a little feeling of competition, like, well, my invention's better than her invention. I'm not really clear on 
why and and obviously she doesn't have every single invention um in here that every woman inventor has created here in the u.s so she had to make selections but i did think it was interesting that this next invention that i want to tell you about was not included in this book so this next invention is one where early in january i got a text from a friend he wanted to show me the sock Book that his sister-in-law had gotten him for Christmas. And there were some intarsia patterns in there. We were talking about intarsia. I had just started this project. I was telling him about how I was managing the yarn. And we were talking about that. And then a couple of days later, he texted me again and said, oh, I meant to show you this. Um, and he sent me a picture of this device called Yarn Apart. And it's a method for dealing with yarn management in intarsia. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And once again, I went online looking to see if I could find one on eBay or Etsy or somewhere. And I couldn't find one anywhere. And he said, you know, I can, you know, lend it to you if you want. I don't, I'm not gonna be using it uh, anytime soon. And I said, I'd love to, cause I was planning on doing a technique video on yarn management in intarsia. It would be really fun to try this out and see what it was. Uh, so he dropped it off and then he said, I think I just, I got this at the, either the Knitter's Guild garage sale or Textile Center garage sale. And he's like, I am not going to use this. You can just have it. Like, Yay. So I want to go to the overhead and I want to show you what this is and what it looks like. But I started researching this woman as well. And there was, I found ads for this product in the 1950s. I started seeing, and then I found an article about, about her, the inventor of this product. And so that the article was in 1951. She just released the product in August and um, supposedly had sold tens of thousands of them to, to different uh, yarn shops and department stores and things. And I could find ads in the paper and then her patent, it, this, this box that I have says patent pending on it. So I wondered if she'd ever gotten, actually managed to get a patent. And she did. She got hers in 1955. But then I don't see any ads for it after that. So I don't know if her goal was to get the patent and then sell the patent uh, and then wasn't able to do that. Um, or if if people decided this wasn't the, the best thing since light spread after all and didn't like it or or she just got sick of of producing it and trying to sell it i i don't know um, but i do know that once it was patented in 1955 i stopped seeing ads in the newspapers about it but i want to go to the overhead and kind of show you uh, what this device is so this is the device on this end it says 10 bobbins when i found ads for this they said you can get it in five bobbins or nine bobbins and i never understood why it would be nine but then this says 10 and there are actually 10 in here this is this bobbin system and you have this little spool right here it comes apart from this right here. So you wind your yarn on this spool here. And then there are these little teeth right here uh, where this is held in, but then there's this tube. And so you have to thread the yarn through the tube. So I've got one here where it's threaded tr through. And they, the device came with this long wire with kind of an, an, an eye at the end of it that you would use to thread it. This particular kit doesn't have it in here but you know it's 70 years old so you know it's amazing that it has everything else in here so the way that i was trying to figure out how could i actually thread this so i did come up with a way of doing it i took um i threaded a needle and i doubled it and knotted it so that this is a big loop and i figured out that what i could do was uh, drop it down here so that it, it came out here and then I could loop through this loop if I wanted to do that so I could thread it through there and pull it through like that and you clip this back in and then you've got your bobbin so the thing is this can dangle without 
uh, just spooling off automatically. There's enough friction in here where it doesn't fall off, but you can easily pull this and release more yarn. So the idea is that you'd have all these things dangling and then they aren't going to swing around and twist around each other because you've got the, something that's more rigid than the, the yarns themselves. They did mention that these should only hang a couple of inches away from the edge of the fabric. Um, and the other thing is there's enough weight on this that you, you, you could have enough tension so that you wouldn't be straining this through your fingers. You would have to change how you actually knit so that you're not winding yarn through your fingers and that you're relying on this to, to give you the tension. Another thing that's interesting to me about this is that this plastic tubing is not brittle. It's, you know, 70 years old and it's not brittle. It's still clear. These pieces come apart uh, and go back together without breaking. The woman who invented this is a physical therapist and she was just observing somebody who was struggling with their they're hanging bobbins tangling around and she thought well there ought to be a better way to do this I'm going to come up with something and she invented this she got all you know apparently tens of thousands of orders for it early on but I wonder if knitters actually found it useful or just thought it was kind of a pain to have to thread this or what the reasons were why this particular system didn't uh, catch on. I think the most interesting thing about this is this bobbin that doesn't just unroll. And I haven't tried pulling this apart. I'm wondering if you could do this without the tube and have a bobbin that worked pretty well without having to have the weight of the tube. But these, this is kind of heavy compared to something like, you know, a, a regular bobbin like this might be a little bit lighter than what, what this is. And then of course a butterfly doesn't weigh anything. What I think Anne McDonald's method has going for it that this method does not have going for it is Anne McDonald came up with a process that works even if you don't have the actual device. It's something that you can create yourself or you can um, make work in some other way. You don't have to have containers, uh, but you can use containers of your own devising, uh, you know, Tupperware containers, uh, cups. You could use yarn bowls. You could use a strainer. You could use a cardboard box that had holes in it. There are all kinds of ways that you can make Ann McDonald's process work without actually having to have the device. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed already, please consider doing so. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.